Halloween edition. My name is Michael Snyder, special reporter for the UCFW. Have you ever wondered where the concept of trick-or-treat came from? Ever wondered why Halloween is associated with dressing up in costumes? How about why do we carve jack-o'-lanterns out of pumpkins? Well, tonight, we will answer those questions and maybe a few more you might have. All the time, we got a couple seasonal Halloween songs for your entertainment and some interesting facts about the holiday that you might find interesting. Toward the close of the show, we also have some safety tips for our young trick-or-treaters that parents might find helpful to keep our children safe out there while they're trick-or-treating this year. I personally have studied a lot of the metaphysical, occult, and various religious venues over the years, so when I was approached about doing a show for Halloween, I was excited to sign on for this. Tonight's historical information is going to come from History.com. I totally agree with their summary about how Halloween's evolved over the years. Their factual information is probably the best summary that I've seen in a long time. So I'll be using some of their actual timeline for the dates that we're all reference to. So, first off, how far back does all this get started? Well, the answer is 2,000 plus years ago with a pagan group of people known as the Celts, or the Celtic region. Uh, that Celtic region was mainly in the UK, France, Northern France, Ireland, what people commonly refer to as some of the Druids. Uh, the festival was called Samhain or Samhain, uh, depending on which region you would ask. And it's always held right around November 1st. Uh, it was looked at as, for the pagan culture, they considered that the marker for their new year. It marked the end of the summer, it had shorter and cooler days, and they believed spiritually that the veil was the thinnest between the living and the dead and the spiritual world. They believed that that's when it got as close as it could get to being kind of evil. Um, they also believed that due to that thinner veil of dimension, that it was the best time for doing divination and fortune-telling things, and they also believed in all this that the ghosts of the dead and other spirits would return. Uh, the night before November 1st holiday is the night when they had their celebrations and their parties. And they had, to celebrate these, they had bonfires, which were considered sacred fire circles. They didn't make animal sacrifices, and a lot of these celebrations and these sacrifices were to pay honor or homage for the harvest that they had had and to give thanks for other benefits that they received through the year. Uh, they did dress up in costumes. Now, their costumes back then were more of animal heads and skins, and they believed that it was to hide themselves or to scare away evil spirits. Uh, some of the pagan celebrations, or some of, excuse me, some of the pagan religions still have Samhain celebrations to this day, marked very much in the same way it was back then. Only difference is that they don't do animal sacrifices, at least none of them that I'm aware of. <laughs> but that's how it all got started with the pagan Celtic cultures. Now, up and around 43 A.D., the Romans come in, and the Romans conquered the lands by then that were the Celtic regions that we talked about. And what they did with it is they infused into the existing Celtic practice two other things that the Romans were known for, which one of them was called Feralia. And it was always held in late October, right around the same time that uh, the Celts had their style in. And it was a festival to honor and pay homage to the dead. They also had another one right about that time called Pomonia. And she was the Roman goddess of fruit and trees. So, you, and again, it was celebrated in that same time of the year, the late October. So, we think that as this has been infused into the existing Celtic cultures, the symbols and the symbolism kind of started to overlap with that. And Pomonia, her symbol being the apple, also made 
as you will see as some of these things carry over and progress, we think that that may be where we might get the bobbing for apples kind of festivities that we see. Because that was one of the key things that infused with it, and they did have celebrations that centered around that portion. Um, as they start to move on down the line, we see long about the year of, well, about the time of May 13th, 609. There was a Pope in the Catholic Church called Pope Boniface IV. And he established this holiday called All Martyrs Day. And it was obviously for celebration of the sacrifices of the martyrs who had given their lives. Um, but a few years after him, come along another Pope named Pope Gregory III. And Gregory III expanded All Martyrs Day to include All Saints. And he moved the date to November 1st. So then, a couple hundred years after that, in the ninth century, uh, these traditions established by the Catholic Church started to carry over into the Celtic regions. And about the year 1000 A.D., they set up another holiday, the Catholic Church did, and it was called All Souls Day, to honor the dead. Now, you're starting to see a pattern here of how these dates are overlapping in conjunction with some of the Celtic pagan practices. It is widely believed that the Catholic Church done that in order to stamp out the existing pagan cultures and practices, which many believe that today, and I would say knowing how some of that's went and knowing your history, it's probably a good, probably a good idea of what they were trying to do. So, All Souls Day had bonfires, and it had costumes, and it had parades, and it had feasts. Just like with the Celts, they were usually, those parties were held the night before. And in this, about this time of the year, we start to see it being called All Hallows Eve. And about that time, there was another thing really popular. And what was popular was these things called, they were like small pastries. They were called soul cakes. And these things were made up, everybody was making them up around that time. And they were especially for that holiday season. And the poor of the region would go around begging for those foods or the soul cakes or for money in exchange for praying, praying for the dead, deceased relatives of a household. So they were going around and asking, you know, knocking on doors and asking for these soul cakes or for money in exchange. They're going to pray for your passed on loved ones. And that's very similar where we think we start to see the concept of modern day trick or treating coming into effect. So, just up to here, you're starting to see how we've gotten some of our foundations, we've gotten some of our old practices maybe laid out, and taking us up to where we're at now. So you can see that come along, and we are going to take a short break. We're going to continue along now with our special Halloween edition tonight. We've covered a lot of the history of Halloween so far. At this point, I want to actually get into how you see Halloween start to take shape in America. We've covered the Celtic regions, we've covered the Roman influence, and the Catholic Church's influence. Now, what about in America? Well, some of these traditions start to take shape when the American colonies were starting to get formed. Uh, the American colonies were not real big at first on any of the Catholic Church's celebrations, like the All Saints Day and the All Souls Day because of a lot of the Protestant influence. But there were some colonies that started celebrating fairly soon. And one of them was in the Maryland area. Uh, those that did celebrate, they had harvest parties. And they had feasts. And they had dancing and singing with these parties. And they also told ghost stories about them. And they also told fortunes. 
they were doing more fortune telling. So you see, this is very similar going back to our Celtic practices that we originally seen. One other added thing was pranks. Pranks started to show up. Little, some of you maybe, if you're old enough, you might remember back to the day when Halloween pranks were really common, and in some places they they still keep carrying on. Um, but that's how it all started uh, here in America. But now if we move slightly forward, around the area of 1846, that's when the Irish potato famine was going on. And you've seen a big influx over here of Irish immigrants into the United States. And when they come through, they brought their culture with them of the Halloween celebrations. And what you find there, if you remember, Ireland is one of the main regions that were originally Celtic. So you're going to see how that carries over here. They continue to have parties with costumes and going to house to out, going from house to house, asking for food or money. Kind of like the old soul cake tradition. So we're starting to see more of our dressing up. We're starting to see once again more of our foundational trick or treating come into play. And the parties, when they had uh, group parties, it was usually the seasonal foods from the fall-type food and harvest. Uh, There's more dressing up again in costumes and fortune-telling. That was still really big there as well. Now, we move into the late 1800s, and by now, Halloween parties had definitely caught on. They were definitely a big thing, but they were more community-oriented instead of maybe just, you know, a group of people in the country having one, or maybe just a church group. It was definitely more community-oriented. They also had the neighborly parties as well, but they had parties for kids and parties for adults. And they had games at these parties. And, of course, more food and costumes. And one of the games played at the parties was the bobbing for apples which we can see might be a carryover from the Roman influence back around 43 A.D. But the difference, the costumes in the late 1800s, they weren't really supposed to be super scary or grotesque. That's a more modern thing. Didn't catch on to a lot later. But, don't want to get ahead of myself. In the 1920s and the 1930s region, the Halloween practice had definitely solidified itself completely as a community-centered holiday with all kinds of parties. Now, we told you back about in Maryland and some of our original colonies, they started to have pranks and practical jokes. Well, in the 1920s and 1930s, those started to get kind of severe. And the vandalism from Halloween was starting to get kind of rough about that. So, that was one of the downfalls of it. But by the 1950s, trick-or-treating, going from house to house, was a full community practice. It was completely everywhere by then. And I can personally say that from relatives I've spoken to that are older relatives of mine, they talked about the Halloween pranks from way back in the 50s onward. And the pranks, some of them were elaborate, and some of them were very damaging. So the vandalism and the pranking was still pretty common back then. Uh, One of the lesser pranks was soaping windows. I know I had a relative talk about getting windows soaked on Halloween with a bar of soap. They'd smear it all over your windows and you'd get up the next day and be like, what the heck, I can't see anything. Uh, That's just one example of some of the pranks that you've seen going on. Now, Presently today, everybody loves a good ghost story. But nowadays, our ghost stories, and you know, again, we've seen through here the other cultures and over the years, ghost stories were still something that they told. But now, they're a lot more grotesque, and you know, horror movies are certainly there for their shock values and whatever. But from since the 1950s region of time, there's not really been a whole lot of extra newness to it. The only difference is the really the costumes and maybe go with pop culture movies or things like that or 
whatever, but they're still really all the practices are just about the same. Now, there is one practice that's really common that you probably wonder, well, why haven't you talked about that yet? That's called the jack-o'-lantern. Well, that concept originally came from our Irish immigrants. Because I told you back about 1846, they had the Irish potato famine, and then they come over here from Ireland, and they brought a lot of their culture with them. Well, one of the things they brought with them was called kind of an Irish urban legend of Jack of the Lantern. And it was basically a story where this guy named Jack, who wasn't the most reputable or nicest person in the world, uh, had some dealings with the devil. And in the course of having these dealings with the devil, he kind of had to trick the devil a little bit in order to get away from him. And every time he tricked him, he said into the deal, you can't come collect my soul. So that was always his way of getting out of things, was setting up a deal with the devil where the devil would not collect his soul. Well, after a couple of run-ins like this, the devil had agreed, okay, fine, I won't come collect your soul. But eventually, old Jack dies. And when he dies... God won't let him into heaven due to his dealings with the devil. And the devil said, Oh, but wait a minute. I can't collect your soul. You're going to roam the earth for eternity. And the legend says that he gave Jack a lump of coal that he could put in a carved out turnip and use that as a lantern to, write, to light his way as he roamed the earth for the rest of time. So, the Irish immigrants, when they come over here, their concept of Jack of the Lantern involved a piece of burning coal in a carved out turnip. Now, when they got here, they found out, hey, America's got this really cool thing called a pumpkin. And you can carve a pumpkin a lot easier than you can carve a turnip. So, that's one of the things where it caught on here is it changed, but it come from the Irish immigrants and it changed over into our, instead of Jack of the Lantern, we got now Jack-o'-lanterns, and now they're pumpkins. So, kind of your backstory there that really brings us up to uh, our present day thing. Um, I do have a few facts for you here, a few quick little facts about Halloween. And... One of those is the iconic black cat. Where'd that come from? Well, you all have heard about the Salem witch trials in early America. Back then, it was believed that witches would turn into cats to avoid being seen or captured. And as we had told you in the history portion, that there were all these ghost stories. So some of that cultural aspect of the witches and the cats that was part of the ghost story carrying that evolved into and be later associated firmly with Halloween. So another one of our interesting facts we have is that did you know almost $6 billion a year is spent on Halloween? Now that includes decorations, costumes, candy. It's unreal. It is an unreal real number, $6 billion. I would have thought it would have been that much. Which, that makes also Halloween the second largest commercial holiday in America. Now, I'm sure you all can guess which the first commercial holiday is being Christmas. But, Halloween number two. Also, just another little cultural brush with Halloween facts. November 1st, in Latin American countries is commonly referred to as the Day of the Dead celebration. Now, some of you might say, well, how would they get November 1st? Remember, the Catholic Church has a very big influence in the Latin American countries. And they have their All Souls Day and their All Saints Day right around there, November 1st and 2nd. So, <clears throat> so the Latin holiday seemed to, of the Day of the Dead, which is kind of their version of Halloween. Only slightly different. Um, another just neat fact, the pumpkin, well, 
turns out that that stuff's really healthy for you. You can actually cook pumpkin down into uh, make, of course, a pumpkin pie. Uh, the seeds of the pumpkin, if you clean them out, clean them off, wash them up, you can actually fry those in a skillet and season those, and they're actually really good. And turns out, the pumpkin's really healthy for you, too. So, maybe a few little-known fun facts there about Halloween. This happens to conclude our historical Halloween flashback. We're going to take another quick break here, along with a song, and we will come back and conclude with some Halloween safety tips out there for some of our trick-or-treaters this year. So, stay tuned. To the conclusion of our special Halloween edition, we're going to wrap up the show tonight with some quick Halloween safety tips for those trick-or-treaters out there. So, parents, please take note and... Uh, you know, the efforts here to keep our children safe out there because we know that can, there are things out there when they're trick-or-treating can be a little bit dangerous for them. And I've compiled some safety tips here that I got from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, their website can be found at aap.org. And they've got a really good list of Halloween tips here that I'd like to go over with you for a moment. One of them they have here is plan costumes that are bright and reflective. Make sure that shoes fit well and the costumes are short enough to prevent the children from tripping. And hopefully to prevent any entanglement or contact with flame. Because, you know, there are jack lanterns out there. They may have candles in them. Don't want anybody catching on fire. <laughs> Would be a bad day. Another thing they add is consider adding reflective tape or striping to costumes and or trick-or-treat bags for greater visibility. I know you can get reflective tape at pretty much about any Walmart. I know you can get it at, and pretty much any department store should carry it. You know, I know the kids may not be excited about having something reflective on their costume, but they're all carrying trick-or-treat bags. So there's another option there. Um, because masks can limit or block eyesight, consider a non-toxic makeup and decorative hats as a safer alternative. And they say if you do go with hats, they should fit properly to prevent them from sliding over the eyes. Again, don't worry about getting tripped up. When shopping for costumes, wigs, and accessories, look for and purchase those with a label clearly indicating that they are flame resistant. Again, we got jack-o'-lanterns out there some people put candles in them. Don't want anybody catching on fire. Uh, if, you, if the costume involves the use of a sword or a cane or a stick that's part of their costume, make sure it's not sharp or too long. Obviously, children get easily hurt with those if somebody happens to stumble or trip. They also recommend obtaining flashlights with fresh batteries for the children or for whoever is escorting the children along. Uh, they recommend do not use decorative contact lenses without an eye examination and a prescription from an eye contact professional. While the packaging on decorative lenses will often make claims such as one size fits all or no need to see an eye specialist, obtaining decorative contact lenses without a prescription is both dangerous and it's illegal. It can cause pain, inflammation, and serious eye disorders or infections, which could lead to permanent vision loss. Additionally, please teach children how to call 911 or their other local emergency number if they have an emergency or if they become lost. Now, some more, because they've got three tips here for carving, pumpkin carving. It says small children should never carve pumpkins. Children can draw a face with the markers and the parents can do the cutting. Seems like common sense, but please don't let your small kids be playing with the knives. <laughs> They also recommend considering the use of a flashlight or a glow stick instead of a candle to light your pumpkin. If you do use a candle, use a votive candle. It's a little bit safe. Votive candles, they're small. They don't take up a lot of room. They burn out on their own fairly quickly. Also, if some of you haven't seen them, I know that you can get what's like a battery-operated votive candle and... I think those things are really cool myself. And I've seen them even at dollar stores before. So that's another little alternative. 
Uh, Kindlit pumpkins should be placed on a sturdy table away from curtains and other flammable objects and should not be left unattended. Again, you've got candles in there. We don't want the house to go down in flames. Some home safe home tips that they recommend. To keep home safe for visiting trick-or-treaters, parents should remove from the porch and front yard anything a child could trip over, such as garden hoses, toys, bikes, and lawn decorations. If you're going to do trick-or-treating, at least make it a safe environment for the kids to come into. Parents should also check outdoor lights and replace any burned out bulbs. Again, just better visibility. We don't want anybody to trip or get hurt. It says also wet leaves or snow should be swept from sidewalks and steps. Wet leaves, guys, that stuff can be as slick as ice. You hit one at the right time, you can go down in a hurry. Uh, also restrain pets so they do not inadvertently jump on or bite a trick-or-treater. Even if your pet's the little Sparky, the friendliest dog in the whole wide world, he may still want to jump and play on the kids, and you know, some kids are terrified of animals. So please re make sure your pets are securely and safely put away. While kids are on the trick-or-treat trail, it recommends a parent or responsible adult should be accompanying the young children on their neighborhood rounds. If you should happen to have older children that are going alone, plan and review the route that's acceptable to you. Agree on a specific time when they should return home. Also, only go to homes with a porch light on and never enter a home or car for a treat. Please reiterate that to your children. Uh, because pedestrian injuries are most common injuries to children on Halloween, remind the trick-or-treaters of some points here. Staying in a group and commu communicate where they will be going to. Carry a cell phone for quick communication. Remain on well-lit streets and use always use the sidewalk. If no sidewalk is available, walk at the far edge of the roadway facing traffic and never cut across yards or use alleys. Only cross the street as a group in established crosswalks as recognized by your local communities. And never cross between parked cars or out of driveways. If you cut between a car, oncoming traffic may not see you. And we don't want anybody to get hit. Don't assume that, as a pedestrian, do not assume that you have the right of way. <laughs> Motorists can have trouble seeing trick-or-treaters. Just because one car stops doesn't mean that others will. Please be vigilant of your traffic. Uh, law enforcement authorities should be notified immediately if you happen to see anything suspicious or anything that you believe is unlawful, please report that to your local law enforcement entities. And the last couple tips here on a healthy Halloween. Parents, a good meal prior to the parties and trick-or-treating might discourage your youngsters from filling up on the Halloween treats. They may thank you, but later, for not having an upset stomach. Uh, consider purchasing non-food treats for those who visit your home such as coloring books or pens and pencils. I know one person personally that was giving out little like packages with glow stick lights. Kids love those. Uh, wait until children are home to start to sort and check their treats. Parents, though tampering is rare, responsible adults should always closely examine all of the candy and treats and throw away anything that might be spoiled or unwrapped or suspicious in any way. And also, last but not least, parents, try to ration the tweet, treats out for the following, uh, the Halloween candy. You know, we don't want them to gorge on it and make them sick. And just try and ration it out with them. And those are the tips that are recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics. We sure do appreciate that resource. This has been our special Halloween edition. We hope all of you have enjoyed our program this evening. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Happy Halloween to all of you out there. Be safe and take care. Good night.
When it comes to building and financing stronger businesses, Apollo does the heavy lifting by providing customized capital solutions to drive innovation and growth. Apollo, investing in tomorrow, today. Learn more at Apollo.com. When it comes to building and financing stronger businesses, Apollo does the heavy lifting by providing customized capital solutions to drive innovation and growth. Apollo, investing in tomorrow, today. Learn more at Apollo.com. Every industry needs to transform for the energy transition, but we have to balance keeping equipment running with progress on decarbonizing. GE Digital's Asset Performance Management software uses AI and predictive analytics to boost operations efficiency, prevent breakdowns, and keep employees and sites safer. All built on a secure and scalable platform and instilled with a century of GE expertise. Search GE APM to learn more. Every industry needs to transform for the energy transition, but we have to balance keeping equipment running with progress on decarbonizing. GE Digital's Asset Performance Management software uses AI and predictive analytics to boost operations efficiency, prevent breakdowns, and keep employees and sites safer. All built on a secure and scalable platform and instilled with a century of GE expertise. Search GE APM to learn more.